What's up guys and welcome back to Moaning. If you guys are new here, then what's up? My name's Erica. Hey ya, how you doing? For today's video, I am chatting to an artist that I have admired from afar for the longest time. I first discovered him over on Twitter and then it led me to swiftly follow him over on Instagram so that I never miss an upload of his incredible Greek mythology inspired art. Now, this art is individual panels depicting some of the most famous myths that you guys know, like Theseus and the Minotaur and the labors of Heracles. However, not only that, but actually this artist gets into even these intricate moments from Greek mythology, like how the gods were born, how monsters were defeated, all of that sort of minor mythology as well that comes into these pieces that I just think is unbelievable. And when I discovered that all of this art was actually in preparation for publishing a book, you guys know that I sent him an email immediately and I was just so gung-ho about bringing him on the channel. So I am absolutely thrilled to sit down today and to chat to Tyler Miles Lockett. So Tyler, before we can get into your books, before we can get into uh, the plans that you have for the future, your art in particular, the way that I start these interviews is actually by asking my guests to explain their classics background and in your case as well, your art background. So when did you first discover Greek mythology and then how did it sort of end up getting combined into now the work that you do with your art? Sure, sure. Um, well, I've been drawing since I was a little boy, probably four or five years old. Um, I used to, you know, sort of keep myself very busy on the floor on my stomach drawing little battles and monsters and all kinds of creatures and, and robots. Uh, I was real into, you know, I grew up in the 80s, so it's was very influenced by a lot of the 80s cartoons and toys and all of that fantasy, you know, so Transformers, He-Man, uh, the Dark Crystal, all of that had a huge impact and then I was just making tons of art uh, as a as a young kid. Uh, I just it was something that I really resonated with me and getting lost in my own worlds. Uh, as far as Greek mythology, uh, I, you know, probably the first was when I was around that same age, around five, four or five. Uh, my dad had a brilliant book from he actually took me to England and we bought some hardback uh, fairy tales and Greek myth books and the art was incredible and he used to read those. So that was definitely the first sort of exposure. Uh, but then in high school, we got into um, the Iliad by Homer, which blew my mind. Uh, and my dad's a literature teacher. So, you know, he, he I, I was lucky enough to grow up with him talking about Shakespeare and uh, British romanticism and all kinds of stuff. But um, yeah, I wasn't prepared for Homer and the Iliad and how good it is. And I remember in, in class, we were reading some passages and I was like looking around at the other students, like, are you guys, this is incredible. Like, I couldn't believe how just poetic and, and powerful and um, and just how elegant and, and the, the prose was and, and the characterization of the characters and stuff like that. So that, that I was like, okay, I've got to get into Homer. I got to read these books and d dig deeper into this stuff. So yeah, those, those were two pivotal uh, entry points for me. So your dad being such a help, you know, the literature side of things, when it comes to your art, do you bounce your art ideas still off your dad or is he, you know, somebody that you show last minute your art to or? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't really, we, he, he's not really there in the, in the process of making it. I'll show it to him after the fact. Uh, but my mom's an artist actually. So I'll, I'll definitely get sort of share her, my art with her. And then she shares her art with me. So we have uh, that very much in common. My dad, uh, we have more, it's more of discussions about literature and talking about uh, writers and philosophers. And um, so I was quite lucky to be raised uh, by somebody who is planting these seeds of, uh, you know, um, these literary topics and, and world religions. And I, I could go on and on about how cool it was to be raised by somebody who was question, you know, making me question things and, and introducing concepts that, you know, uh, from Zen Buddhism to, um, you know, stoicism to stuff like that. So yeah, quite lucky to have been exposed early on. That is so sweet that you're like this perfect combination of both of your parents. Like what? Yeah, I've got, I've got a bunch of negative traits too that I won't bore you with, so. <laughs> but your dad, isn't he with you currently in Thailand? Cause you travel and you work. 
Correct. I'm a digital nomad. I've been uh, working online remotely. I've been traveling for many years, about 10 years. Uh, eight of seven or eight of that was uh, teaching English online while doing my own art projects. But yeah, he's he's traveling with me. We've been we've done about three years together and we've done 10 countries together. So it's um, and again, like he's a very um, liberal arts um, humanities type of person. So he's a good traveler. We're, he's very curious about world cultures. So we have a lot of fun sort of going to the museums and learning about the, the historic, the culture's histories and stuff like that. So he's a good travel partner. So can you tell us a little bit what it's like to travel and do your work on the road? You mentioned there, you know, teaching English as well online. So how do you sort of combine all those things to end up with, I guess, this life that so many people, you know, look at internet jobs and they want themselves? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, so I'll try to give you the short version. I, I went to I went to Parsons School of Design in New York City and studied art. I got my bachelor's in illustration there. And I, you know, I always knew I was going to wanted to be an artist. Um, and then after school, I worked in advertising in New York for a while. And, you know, that was, uh, mon- you know, it was uh, financially rewarding, but not so much creatively. And then I went and worked in video games for a couple of years, which was really fun. But I still had my own ideas for my own book ideas and my own some of my own projects that I wanted to do. And I felt like I couldn't do both. So I was like, and I knew I wanted to travel because um, so, I had had a couple travel experiences by that point, which I was like, oh, travel is really important and, and kind of life changing and life affirming. So I went to Japan and started teaching English. I knew I would find it, I knew I could teach there. Um, and so teaching English uh, just became really a way for me to travel and to experience the world. And then once I started teaching online, I really got more aggressive about travel. So I was like, oh, cool, I can live anywhere. So then I really started changing countries every couple of months and uh, experiencing some cultures that I had always wanted to visit. Uh, and then I got a little bit more intentional about my art and, and the Greek mythology and the book and sort of saying, okay, let's let's set a goal. Let's you know, reasonable and let's, let's jump into this like a hundred percent. So before we get to your book, cause I obviously want to talk about the book. That's where this is all really going. I want to talk to you about your style because your art style is so distinctive. It's one that literally, if you're scrolling fast through Twitter, you'll always stop. Cause you know, it's your piece of art. Oh, that's awesome. That's good to hear. So I'm wondering where that comes from. You know, what artists inspired you and what helped you craft the style that you now draw in? It's a, it's a good question. It's a hard question. It's, um, there's so many influences, I think, that uh, these little sort of drops in the bucket that um, I think, as I mentioned, that, you know, growing up in the 80s with uh, the fantasy video games and movies and animation, that had a huge effect. So everything from the Disney stuff to... Like I said, the Dark Crystal and, uh, you know, those types of uh, the darker stuff in the 80s, I really liked. I even like some of the horror movies in the 80s. When I was a kid, I was, you know, uh, my dad, you know, uh, let me watch some of that stuff and it had an impact. Um, so I love the darker stuff. So that I so my work, even if the content isn't dark aesthetically, it does sort of start to tend to drift to a darker sort of place. Uh, but specifically, um Nowadays, I would point to a lot of the golden age illustrators from the 50s and 60s. So people like Ivan Earl or uh, Mary Blair, who did concept art for Disney. Um, she she did Peter Pan and Cinderella and A Small World. And so her stuff is so economical. Um, that's something I really admire about her work is that her brush strokes and her color use is very intentional and efficient. She's not She's not getting lost in details and getting lost in she, it's like she knows exactly what she wants to do and she just executes that, which I, I really uh, admire that efficiency. I'm trying to be more efficient with, um, because with digital art, it's very easy to go, oh, let me try this, let me try this, let me try this. And you keep going down all these little rabbit holes and you wasted so much time. So somebody that's an artist like her, uh, Mary Blair, that's so intentional and efficient, I really admire that. And she does gouache. Uh, which is a very unforgiving um, medium. It dries super fast. So I, I have a lot of uh, admiration for artists like that. So yeah, the Golden Age illustrators, I think their work is just very charming. Um, and uh, 
I don't know. There's something about that time period that's just they were just on. They were just rocking and rolling back then with their with the the children's book illustrations are so magical and so uh, just full of wonder. You know, something I love when looking back at artists like I'm so weird, but like I watch all of these videos on YouTube, which are just like how cartoon characters have changed over time, like based on the artistry. So recently, totally off topic. Do you know Dex's Laboratory? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so I watched like a whole video about how Dee Dee has changed from like original sketch to I I just love that like behind the scenes sort of like look into things. The evolution. How, yeah, I, I find that so fascinating. So check out The Simpsons. Oh, really? Oh, man. The very first season of The Simpsons was on the Tracy Ullman show. And this was 20, 25 years ago or whatever, maybe 30. And yeah, they look like pretty rough chicken scratchy characters compared to how they yeah. It's interesting. I love that stuff. So it's cool. That's why with your art, I absolutely adore when you post those like reels of like, here's the original sketch. And then, you know, moving from that to then kind of coloring it in to then scanning it to then uploading it to then final. Like, I just love seeing that because you see how those shapes change and then the color comes into it. And it brings it alive and all of that. So Cool. I'll keep like doing that. them. Please do. Honestly, like I share them whenever you post them. Oh, good. Yeah, they're fun to make too. I like to share that back, the behind the scenes stuff. So what is that process like and how long does that process take? Because we see it in, you know, 20 seconds when you upload it. Try and give you the short version. So when I started this project with this Greek mythology book, part of my part of the my intention was also to get very intentional about my art process because I was finding that I was getting lost in the weeds in some of my images and, and getting lost in some detail that may, may not necessarily matter. And back to the Mary Blair thing about that efficiency, execution, and kind of, because you can get lost in that last eight, 20, 10 to 20% of something, and it, you, you're spinning your wheels in a way, and it's like, it'd be better to use that energy on the next image, in my opinion. So I got very intentional about, okay, let's, let's set time limits for each of these stages of the image. So thumbnails, which is the tiny little uh, compositional black and white sketches I do first, just to kind of get my idea, get my head wrapped around the composition, the values, what are the shapes, uh, light on dark, dark on dark on light, what's that going to be like? So I typically spend about an hour to two hours on that. Then I'll move to um, the line work. I'll spend an hour or two on that. Then I'll move to the color sketch. I'll spend about an hour on that. And then the final painting could take anywhere from five hours, you know, probably around five hours. So hopefully I, over the course of two days, I can kind of knock something out that I'm happy with. Some go a little faster, some go depending on complexity longer, but yeah, within, hopefully within two days, I'm, I'm happy with what I can from, from initial concept to final day. That seems like an awfully long time. Does it? Two days? I'm just hearing that. I'm thinking like how, just like how intricate they are and how detailed they are and how much work is put into them, how much love is put into each and every one of them. And I mean, you say that they're in preparation for a book. So you have like, what seems to me is like hundreds of these images in preparation for this book. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's like, I think, I think right now I'm at 120, 100, it's probably gonna be 130, 140 images. So, and they're full page, full color, full page spreads. So um, yeah, I don't, you know, let me know if you if you see any books like that. I don't know any illustration books that have that that are that heavy. Uh, it's kind of crazy that I'm, there's so that's like I was actually really worried about the printing costs. I was like, oh my god, is 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 anyone is this even going to be printable? It's like too much color and too much. But luckily, uh, if I'm planning to do the self publishing route, the the printer uh, that I'm looking at using doesn't charge based on the amount of ink used. So that's good news. Okay, so backtrack to step one of this. Can you tell us a bit about the book? For people who are listening and who are hearing us saying book and throw around, you know, all this art. Can you explain what the book is for them, what they can expect from it, you know, that sort of stuff? Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, we were talking about the golden age of illustration and, and kind of, I mentioned, um, you know, my dad reading a book to me about Greek mythology. So, you know, the, my, my goal really is to create art, contemporary illustration that really ca uh, captures the imagination of these tales and also kind of brings it, uh, brings these 
visions forward in a way that we haven't really seen them. So the, um, my goal is always to do something original and unique. So hopefully when you're looking at some of this, you're like, oh, I never thought about the Minotaur having being white and having that design. Or I've never thought about, you know, that's not how I pictured Kerberos. I thought that was a black dog, but I, did, I portray him differently. So and in stylistically as well, trying to put a spin on these on these myths. So visually, I want to do something really um, full of wonder, like the children's books. But these this book is not for kids because I'm staying very authentic to Hesiod and Homer and and the literary sources. And uh, you know, there's a lot of dark stuff that goes on. There's there's a lot of violence. There's sexual violence. There's uh, you know a lot of just pretty terrible stuff going on between the characters. Um, so I'm staying true to that. So this is not something I would read to a six or seven year old. Um, but at the same time, I'm not portraying that stuff with a lot of gratuitous imagery either. So, um, but yeah, as far as the content of the book, I'm summarizing the myths. I'm hopefully giving some cultural and historical context, some academic information that you may not be aware of, uh, depending on who you are. So in theory, if you're a complete beginner, you can you can read this book and get a really great overview of, you know, the, the, the general myth and some academic cultural uh, historical information. And if you are like someone like yourself, well versed in the classics, you can you can just kind of it could be a, a review and have some cool art to go with it and kind of something that so hopefully everyone can appreciate it on, on some level. And planning this book, what is that like? Because I think for a lot of people who, you know, whether it's they watch this channel and they listen to my author interviews or they just read books or they buy these kinds of books, you know, most of those are done through traditional publishing. So they give you parameters to work with. They say, you know, you've got to have this many pages or this many words or by this date or whatever it is. So what's that planning process like for somebody who's doing it themselves and that has to create almost those deadlines, the parameters, the page number, you know, how's that been? Yeah, this is where my imposter syndrome starts to like, I mean, it's a little bit of trial, trial and error and kind of figuring out as I go. Um, but yeah, it's funny with, with this topic because there's definitely been days where I'm like, man, I gotta like cut some of this because this, I could just do this for the rest of my life. I, I could, you know what I mean? It's just the amount of and there's still there is still stuff I want to put into this book, and I'm like I just don't, I I'll be working on this for the next three years. I gotta like so um, so yeah I you know I just I kind of wanted to do the stuff that is really the broad strokes. So the primordial deities, the Olympians, and then I got five or six of the main myths. So we've got Orpheus, Theseus, Perseus, Atalanta, the Amazon warrior women, Pericles, and then I was going to do Bellerophon, but I don't think he's going to make the cut. Uh, he may. We'll see. And then uh, Argonautica is the one I'm going to do next, which I'm super excited to do. And it's quite an epic tale, obviously. So I'm going to have to figure out how to edit that down to something reasonable. But um, but yeah, those are the broad strokes. And then, of course, I've got an introduction with like talking about Homer and Hesiod and other literary, uh, classic literary sources and a map and, and some of the religious stuff about the Hellenic polytheism and, and the mystery cults. So I'm just really trying to give a bit broad overview of, like I said, like you could come to this topic and not know anything about it and read the whole book and and, and it wouldn't take you too long because the, 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 the structure is gonna be one page of art and one page of summary and, and um, some some interesting cultural information. And that's the whole book. Boom, 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 boom. So you can really move through it. It's really concise, but hopefully powerful and punchy. You briefly said there about imposter syndrome. So I kind of want to tap into that a little bit more because you're not traditionally classically trained. And I'm just wondering, because I feel imposter syndrome personally, and I am traditionally trained. I'm somebody that went through all the professors, all the lectures, all the everything. And I still put out a video and I'm like, oh my God, like someone's going to find something wrong with this or I left something out or whatever it is. So for you, I mean, how bad is the imposter syndrome? Or do you find that because there's no necessarily like backdrop to it of like the classroom and the professor leaning down and you being like, you mistranslated this, it's not as bad as it possibly could be. 
You know, it's a it's an interesting question about imposter syndrome. Um, the first thing I'll say is that my passion overrides my embarrassment of making mistakes. So I'm, you know, the, I'm so interested in the the plots and the characters and the the interwoven uh, threads of the of the of Greek mythology. It's such a brilliant, um, such a brilliant structure and design. Um, and, and I love the Greek tragedy. I love the, the I love the tragic heroes, and the, I just love that stuff. Uh, I'm also I also do I've got some fiction stuff in the works, and I just that stuff is so inspiring for character arc development and plots, and it's just brilliant. So nothing can take away from that interest. Um, but writing a book about it that's a different situation. You're presenting information. Um, you know, I, I I put it out there. I do my research. I go to the source material and I use that. And, you know, um, I'm going to do my best. People tell me I'm wrong sometimes or actually, it, they, you know, it's actually this and not that. And that's fine. I love to hear. I love to be corrected. Um, so people on Instagram or Reddit or, or Twitter or wherever I'm posting stuff from time to time will correct me. And I say, thank you so much. Please do. Please keep correcting me. So um, for me, it's an opportunity to learn. I don't, I try not to be too afraid of being wrong because I know if I'm wrong, people are going to let me know and that's fine. And, and, and people are always very polite because they know I'm coming from a genuine place of, um, uh, of passion and interest. And I'm, and I'm also, they also hopefully know my personality by now where I'm pretty humble about being schooled and I'm okay with it. I'm, I don't fight back. I don't argue. Well, no, no. I mean, unless somebody's unless I've really done my homework about something and I know the source material and they're coming at me from a different angle, then I'll fight back or whatever. But, you know, somebody like you, if you said, Hey, actually Homer said this or that, I'd be like, Oh, thank you so much. I, I didn't catch that or whatever. So yeah, just staying flexible. Um, yeah. It makes it, makes it all run smoothly. So building that like community that's going to be in conversation with you about your art, that's an important thing for your sort of whole project. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I love it. I love, um, I love people just not only like correcting me, but just, um, telling me why they love this or what they think about that or why they do like this character or don't like, or just hearing other people's opinions about the content and, and everything. It, it makes it, uh, it makes it just so super fun to communicate with the uh, community about that. Yeah. I couldn't agree with that more because when I have like my imposter syndrome, which I know I have to like swallow all the time because I'm like, get over it. Like you said, passion overrides it and it's fine to be wrong. So the way I get over that is by inserting questions in my video constantly where I'll say, oh, I, I don't actually know how to pronounce that. So I'm going to skip over this guy's name or I'm going to say it this way. If you're Greek, let me know in the comments or whatever it is. So I always ask my audience and there's that constant communication with them as well. And that it makes me feel like I have more of a team rather than like fans who watch my videos, if that makes sense, you know? And it's a learning opportunity for you. Like, hey guys, I'm not sure about this. Please somebody educate me. And then somebody does educate you and then you get to move forward with now you know the pronunciation. So it's a win-win, right? Absolutely. So where do you find it's best for you and your audience like to connect? So, like what platform is your favorite to speak to people and sort of get their feedback? A lot of people, I'd say Twitter is a big one. I'm sorry, not Twitter. Instagram is probably the biggest. Uh, Twitter as well, a little bit. But Reddit, a lot of people like to get into stuff on Reddit, on my Reddit posts. We get into discussions there. And then Discord. I have a Discord. Um, it was more active before, and then I kind of it was on hiatus for a while, and now I'm kind of reviving it. So hopefully uh, we can get a, a community, a more active community on my Discord. And I'm also... Uh, I haven't, I'm not like a hundred percent committed, but I'm probably going to do the, so full disclosure, I have a few other books that I want to do in the, in the, in the coming years. Uh, the Trojan cycle, all eight books. I want to do that of the, the whole Trojan cycle. Um, and I also, cause I just think it's a lot of people don't even realize that there's eight books and fragments and all that that make up that whole. And just also chronologically to see how all of those books create this chronological I think that would be amazing to do. Uh, Shakespeare's Tragedies, King Arthur's Knights, um, possibly Japanese mythology. And then of course, there's so many other world mythologies, Norse mythology, Hindu mythology. Um, so I may be doing the Trojan cycle next year. And if that's the case, I definitely want to get a more active community on my Discord and other places to, 
to get a little bit more intentional about bringing people onto the to to contribute to the process uh instead of just putting out art after the fact and being like what do you guys think i would like to people to say you know hey what do you guys please guys give me some ideas about the costume differences between the trojans and the greeks what do you think about colors what do you think about architecture differences you know how should achilles how should the myrmidons look different from the other greeks stuff like that uh because it's you know it's no it's a it's no small order to design all that stuff um so anyways yeah i'd like to get get a little bit more um bring bring people into the the creative process more on the next one actually so do you hope then with each book with each project that community is building building you get more voices sort of helping you along the way absolutely absolutely yeah yeah i mean because when you just do that kind of stuff in a vacuum by yourself um it's just it's not as much fun it's so much more fun to have people you know bond like even people telling you oh no don't do that because xyz is like oh good thank you or you know have you thought about this oh no i haven't that's a great idea so i mean yeah it's just it, it makes it a lot more um uh, what's the word just yeah just rewarding yeah I, I have that as well with my videos, especially when I do summaries, like, cause I'll put out my summary video, which does exist with me in a vacuum of just reading, summarizing, sorting it out. But as I said, I always put in questions. So at the end, I'll always say, if I've left something out there that you think is important to understanding this chapter, then leave it below. And I always have people pointing things out that even though as I was reading it, I noted it, I would never have thought that it stood out for somebody else. And so it's kind of made me go back to that and be like, what is it about that character that that person, you know, latched onto or that detail that that person found really interesting? So it it helps me to go back and to read in a different way as well. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's the same with the art. Like people respond to stuff that I didn't expect them to because I thought, oh, this is the thing that I'm so interested in this image is X, Y, Z. But somebody else might be like, no, this uh, this thing over here is interesting for X. And I'm like, oh, I didn't realize or, you know, so, yeah, that's always fun to get that to get the uh, interpretation of other people. So for you then, as the artist, what is the best piece that you've created for this current book that's coming out? And by best, I don't necessarily mean the most impressive. I mean, maybe the one that took the most work that you're the most proud of, or that was the trickiest to do, or maybe that just is your favorite. Okay, yeah, good question. Uh, the first one that pops into my head is the Theseus uh, uh, in the Minotaur, in the labyrinth, because it was a very difficult image to do. I struggled with it more than others, uh, partly because I forced myself to try to do something that was a little bit outside of my comfort zone. And I did a little video on my Instagram about, you know, hey guys, this is my struggle on this one. So, you know, I, st I started out with that image. It was just kind of the sketches I was doing were just just not special at all, not unique, just very like standard. And then I was like, ah, I got to do something special. This is such an iconic moment from Greek mythology. Um, and I also love labyrinths. I think, oh, this is an opportunity to do something cool. So then I, you know, long story short, I thought about the, the, the viewer getting lost in the image and being confused by the imagery with different angles and perspectives. And I thought, oh, now that's an interesting idea. How are we going to execute that? So I started looking at MC Escher and the impossible geometry. And, and basically did something that was, uh, you know, based on that sort of structure, uh, visual structure. So, you know, it was, there was some growing pains and some, some stress and trying to figure out how do I, how do I do this impossible geometry thing? But, but uh, I was really happy that I pushed myself out of my comfort zone. So that one has, has some blood, sweat and tears in it that I'm proud of. I love also the color contrast in that one. Cause Theseus is like holding his, his little torch and all around that it's like, it's a little bit light next to him, but it just gets darker and darker. And as you said, it gets more confusing then because, you know, everything is all sort of warped in weird ways. And so as you're sort of looking into the darkness, I'm like, there's so much to this piece. Yeah. And also you can rotate that image and you'll see every, like, there's three different planes and they, like, as you rotate it, the planes are going to work. Same thing with kind of the impossible geometry. Like if you look at it from a different angle, it all works. From different angles so yeah i have two other of my favorite pieces that come to mind 
of yours, obviously not just like general random art <laughs> that I'm like, oh, let's look at this guy now. <laughs> For the rest of the interview, I want to talk about somebody else. So one of them is obviously the bard one that you did, which is just absolutely stunning. I think that one is one of the most beautiful pieces of illustration that I've ever seen, genuinely. I, I just loved it. I just thought that you really captured this idea of like sitting around and listening to to these songs, to these poems, just in like this one panel. I don't know. I just, I thought it was absolutely beautiful. And the other one that I loved is the Pythia one that you did. This one's quite old, but I loved the Pythia one and I'm not quite sure why. I think it's maybe similar to the Theseus one that there's that huge color contrast in that one that's really vibrant. The Pythia, the, the first the first from the Theseus series? Yes. Yeah, 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 gotcha. Mm -hmm. I loved those two. I thought those two were just so different again. And I think that, you know, that that beauty in taking the myths and reinterpreting them, how do you, as an artist, separate yourselves from, I guess, sort of a canon that's been done before? Like you were mentioning earlier, you have, you know, characters that you've done in different colors, you know, that you've just styled differently and people have this idea in their head already not because that's how necessarily, you know, all the ancients depicted it, it's because one person did it that way and it's been a knock-on effect. So as an artist, how do you separate yourself from from that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Cause like you said, if you, you know, we've all been exposed to imagery of, you know, ancient Greece or Greek mythology. And a lot of what happens is illustrators over the generations are recreating the stuff they've seen other illustrators or painters do versus doing the taking the time to do the research about the architecture or the clothing or um yeah so it's like it's kind of like a game of telephone right like a visual game of telephone where you this things start to get a little distorted but you know don't get me wrong some artists are very on top of their uh you know research and their their work looks authentic uh, yeah, the short answer is just going back to the source material and getting as much, uh, staying true, as true to that as possible and looking at the costumes and the, the you know, the visual elements. Um, and then also trying to think about where can I, where can I play with this in a way that is, is we're still respecting the ancient culture, but also uh, pushing it in a direction that I have never seen. You know, so a really silly example is like just giving Zeus dark hair and a dark beard because he wasn't like an old man. He was actually the youngest to be born. And, you know, it could but could also be something like Kerberos, the, the dog that, that guards the, the gates of uh, Hades. So typically that like nine times out of 10, it's going to be a black dog with fiery eyes or whatever. Um, I I portray the dog like more as like almost like translucent skin. You can see some of the bone structure and it's almost like a, a, a kind of ghosty kind of thing. So yeah, it's like, well, wait a minute, why do I have to do Kerberos black? Like who says he's black? So, uh, you know, if I can't, if I don't see something in, in the source materials, like if everyone, if there was a consensus that Kerberos was black, I'm gonna do it black because I want to stay true to what they thought. If, if there is a consensus, of course, there typically isn't, right? Because there's like tons of, uh, different versions, obviously. So yeah, uh, long story, uh, that's a long answer to, to basically just say, I try to stick to the source material wh where I can and where it makes sense and then try and take some swings and some uh, some new directions uh, to try to make it feel fresh as well. Well, I think you hit on something really important there that I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this without it sounding rude because everything I tend to say sounds rude, but I don't mean it to, but like, I think that people get very protective over certain versions of characters. And, it, you know, when you go back to the ancient source material, you can say, well, according to this person, this is the case. And if this person's basing it on that person, then that's incorrect. Like, of course, there's always that argument there. But in general, you know, these writers were even writing years and years and years, you know, apart from one another. So they have very different ideas that are impacting the character, the way buildings looked, the way mythology works. Like we have so many versions of different myths that, you know, they related to that audience at the time that it was being written. And so I think that, you know, people forget that when looking at things like art or retellings because they latch onto the one version that they know and they safeguard it a lot of the times. 
Yeah, and it, and it happens with the visuals too, right? You've got the Greek pottery, and then you've got the, the statues, and the, you know, into the Roman stuff, and so you'll you'll see the visual variety of the different characters evolving and changing over time. So, um, yeah, I just yeah, that's that's part of that's part of the artist's uh, prerogative is to kind of hopefully look at that stuff and then pick what makes sense. Like for example, for the Trojan cycle. Um, I'm probably going to go with later era classical armor because I find it more beautiful and more fun to draw versus the older stuff, which is, you know, more would be more realistic, but it wouldn't be as like, um, what's the word, like mm, sophisticated or, or ornate, you know. Um, so that's, you know, I, I someone could could give me a criticism of that, um, which would be valid. And like, hey, this isn't what they, it's, but at the same time, it's like, this is mythology and the artist gets to, from time to time, make make a creative decision about how they want to portray that. But but uh, nine times out of 10, I'm doing my best to stick to some sort of, um, try to stay authentic to some, some sort of source material. And I would agree with the armor thing, just because, I mean, like I've read the Iliad to death, I'm obsessed with it. And like they use very, very old styled armor. Like the idea that you're going to draw a boar's tusk helmet for like the majority of people, that's not the most visually stunning helmet. It's a cool helmet, but like to draw that over and over and over again, to draw the little panels, you don't have that same like flair as the later helmets do. Yeah. And like that, that stuff, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, that stuff is very operatic, you know, it's like so, this, it's so epic in scope. So. The costumes, the sets, I think of that like very cinematically or um, or it could be like an opera or whatever, however, you know, you want to. But yeah, like, you know, colors and shapes and um, create to create the most drama and visual interest. I'm going to pick certain things that are going to accentuate all that. Yeah, 100 percent. So you are self-publishing this book, as we have discussed. So for everybody listening how can they best support that project? Because that's not an easy thing as we've discussed and you're behind every part of this self-publishing process. So what can we do to help? Uh, pr just pray for me, really, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been working on the book for about a year and a half. So I'm, I think I'm about 80% done. Um, like I said, I still need to put Argonautica in there and uh, I gotta edit the book. Um, so I'm going to need some help with editing, uh, beta readers and people to help me make sure I've got all my my T's crossed and my I's dotted and my my references and things are, um, you know, uh, authentic to the source materials and stuff. But the best thing people can do is, uh, number one, join my new, my free uh, email newsletter subscription and they're going to get some some free high res download art 25 percent off in my uh, etsy print shop and that's just a way that i can keep in touch with people off of uh social media just in case something happens with a social media platform and and you lose your followers or you lose that connection so email um is, is the best way and i probably email once a month so i'm not like inundating people with stuff but yeah once it goes live on kickstarter and i'm like okay guys let's do this please help like let's make this thing happen the email is the best way because it's like, hey, it's live. We're going live now. Let's because um, it's something that you want because you've only got a month. And in fact, you really want that those first few days to try to meet the goal for for the thing to uh, get catch some momentum. So, yeah, join the newsletter um, and yeah, just any social media channels they want to. And like, I love to hear from people and to 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 have some dialogue. And, and so, yeah, would love to hear from anyone. I would like to stress that. A newsletter point just because you're so right with regards to the social media like if anything happens with those as we've seen things have happened with social media there are times when you know Instagram goes down for a day or Twitter stops working because you know it hands over management you know things like that happen all the time and platforms get frozen so I cannot stress that point enough that if you guys who are watching like somebody's work or appreciate somebody's work to subscribe to newsletters because that is like Tyler's way of letting you guys know that things are happening without those apps having to work and also without you guys having to go on and check those apps as well. It's coming straight to you, which is important. And God forbid I post a, a illustration of Aphrodite with a nipple showing at some point and then get banned or whatever, you know, who knows? So um, 
I've been lucky. I haven't had any problems so far, but yeah, email is going to be the safest option. But um, yeah, any social media. And of course, um, if people want to, uh, you know, if they're interested in the book, just please uh, stay tuned because, you know, it's coming it's coming soon, more information about it, and, and it's it's going to happen. So I'm super excited to get this book out in, into the world and into people's hands. A lot of people have been showing a lot of interest in, in getting a hold of it as well. So I can't wait. I'm super excited. It's my first one. It's been a dream for a long time. I've always dreamed of, of doing something like this. So the, the last couple of years of work are, are starting to come to some sort of fruition. Um, and, and yeah, I'm just super excited about it. It's going to be amazing. I'm really nosy, so I really want to ask this. I can cut this if you want me to cut this question, because I ask a lot of people this question, they'll oftentimes be like, you can't let people know all of this. But this is, as you were saying, like such a dream of yours to do, and now you're doing it. So you then have all of your plans for future books. What's a dream that you're not hitting at the moment that you've always wanted to do that you hope to hit after these projects, that that's what you're working towards? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um... So, yeah, so these books, like the Greek mythology, Shakespeare, King Arthur, that stuff is definitely, those are dreams. Like, I've thought about these, like, oh, man, I would love to illustrate that stuff and, like, create a book where someone could, like, read through it. And it wouldn't take them a week or two weeks. It's something they could kind of get through, possibly in a sitting, but they would have, like, a really great overview of all of this information. So, yes, that has, that, those have been dreams for a while. But I'd say the main dream is really my own fiction stuff. I've got some fiction stuff that I've been chipping away at over the years. Uh, one is a fantasy mythological thing. So it's a very complicated, um, it's a lot of world building. It's just from scratch, but of course a lot of it's influenced by a lot of different ancient cultures. So that is something I'm hoping to, uh, I'm thinking maybe next year we'll see, um, if I could create a, uh, uh, episodic fiction like a blog and just put up a chapter with art maybe once every couple of weeks or something and just slowly let that kind of build an audience and, and let people say hey we like this or we don't like that or but um that that's something i'm working towards um so yeah the fiction the, i've got a sci-fi thing as well so it's you know i've got some other genre stuff uh other genres but yeah the, i would say those are those are definitely uh top top tier dreams so it's even more important that people then subscribe to the newsletter to get emails from you so that when all of this stuff starts happening, like it doesn't start and end with these books, it goes so much further than that. Correct. And I, I really the decision I have to make is do I want to do the Trojan cycle or Shakespeare's tragedies or do I want to invest all of that time into my own fiction because it's really hard to do both and I've got commission work coming in. I've got some really fun, exciting commission projects that I'm super excited about. Um, so it starts to become a little bit of a, a overwhelming thing about like how to use, there's only so many hours in the day. So, um, but hey, beautiful problem to have. These are all pretty cool, you know, ways to spend our time. So I don't feel too, too uh, sorry for myself, you know. To wind this interview down then, Tyler, I have one last question, which I ask everybody. And that's, always because I just love to leave on a piece of advice for my audience, for the community that we've built here on Moan Inc. I know a number of them will be watching this who have dreams and aspirations to go after maybe, you know, either writing a book or drawing a book in the way that you are. But maybe they're too scared, maybe they don't know what they're doing, they have this imposter syndrome. What's the advice that you would give to that person that desperately wants to do this but doesn't really know how to start? I guess my, the, I mean, there's a couple of things that come to mind. Number one is that it's never been a better time to make your own thing and get it out into the world. And, you know, there's print on demand, there's self-publishing options. Um, so those tools are at our fingertips in a way that they weren't in the past. And with social media, you can find your people, your audience, people that love, that share that passion a lot easier than you could in the past. So those are huge advantages. Like if I want to do it, uh, you know, if I wanted to do a book on like skateboarding dogs, I can find that, I can find that audience. They're out there. I just got to go to skateboardingdogs.com. And no. so find the audience. And then the other piece of advice I would give would really be about, um, you know, when you write a book or you illustrate a book, something that's that large in scope, um, one of the most important things that I've found is the discipline and the consistency. 
because as an artist, a lot of people think that your inspiration is just like uh, kind of what drives it all. And don't get me wrong, the inspiration is very important, but what's more important is the discipline of sitting down and doing the art when you may, may, may not be in the mood. Same thing like working out. It's like you just do it every day. You get onto a routine and it becomes your lifestyle and then you don't think about it. You don't think about, oh, do I really want to go to the gym? Like, no, we're, I've been doing this for years. It's five o'clock. It's time to go work out. It's kind of time to go exercise, whatever the, or whatever your, you know, your lifestyle is. So yeah, discipline, consistency, uh, picking, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to write this book in six months. Well, how many images do I want? I want 50. Well, how many do you need to do per week to reach that goal? So long-term goal, breaking that into shorter term goals, that uh, to me is like down and dirty where the rubber meets the road uh, advice about whether or not you can you can actually reach the goal is like breaking it down into those manageable parts and then being consistent and disciplined about hitting those short-term goals. Yeah. I could not agree with that more, Tyler. That is such a good place to end. I couldn't have said that better myself. So thank you so much for chatting with me today. And obviously, as I say, at the end of all of these calls, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for supporting my channel. But more importantly, thank you guys for supporting Tyler's work because all of the links to Tyler's social medias, his Discord, all of that sort of stuff can be found in the description below. So please do not forget to check that out in order to help support the art that Tyler does and the work that Tyler does for this community and broadening it out to a wider audience. So with all that being said, it's time to love you and leave you. And thank you so, so much for tuning in. We'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Monink. So I'll see you guys then. Bye.